Hello, world history students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have notes for Chapter 26, Section 4, The War Ends. So here we go. Uh, the United States entered World War I when Germany attacked the Lu Lusitania and other ships, killing many Americans. Uh, the German leaders tried to push Mexico into attacking the United States through a document known as the Zimmerman Note or the Zimmerman Telegraph. Um, I should mention, you know, the Lusitania, which is the sister ship of the Titanic, uh, was actually sunk in 1915. But it was a great concern to Americans because there were a lot of American passengers on board. Though I will say this, if you take a look kind of towards the middle of the page here, uh, the German government had actually issued a notice in the New York Times warning American passengers not to ride on the Lusitania. Uh, the Lusitania was a ship that was actually owned by the British government. And hence, it was targeted by the Germans. Uh, probably unbeknownst to a lot of the passengers that were aboard, uh, the Lusitania was actually carrying contraband, which is basically military supplies uh, that were coming from the United States and being used by the British in the war effort. Uh, there were German spies here in the United States, and they were pretty much aware of what was being loaded uh, on and off our ships that were coming into different harbors. Uh, as far as the Zimmerman note is concerned, Arthur Zimmerman, who you see pictured below, was the ambassador to, German ambassador to Mexico. And he had sent a uh, encrypted note, which is pictured right here, uh, basically to the Mexican government offering, uh, you know, an opportunity for the Mexicans if they would get involved uh, with a war with the United States that the German government, as far as uh, the terms at the end of World War One, they would make sure that the United States handed back places like Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, basically territories that were gained during the Mexican War back in the, the late 1840s. Uh, needless to say, we had uh, basically uh, been able to decipher this note, and we kind of knew what the Germans were up to. But really, to get the United States into World War I, it was multiple events. Uh, Lusitania, kind of the beginning, the Zimmerman note happening at the beginning of um, 1917, and also the withdrawal of Russia uh, from the Allies. Um, basically, those three events bring the United States on board to fight World War I. And we do not declare war on Germany until April 6, uh, 1917. So, number two, Germany's policy on submarine warfare changed uh, when they began unrestricted attacks on American ships, thus breaking what is known as the Sussex Pledge. This was a pledge that was made uh, early in the war that the Germans would not target American vessels, uh, but that all changes uh, when we get into about 1916, 1917. Uh, anything that could be carrying contraband to help the Allies would be targeted, even if the United States would remain neutral. And, th and that's the reason why the Germans, uh, for the most part, were prompted to attack us. All right. So when the United States gets into the war, we do start a draft. And I want you to take a look at this political cartoon. Uh, this is the uh, the U.S. Army's uh, version of the perfect soldier. You know, a big dude with not uh, a lot of brains, I guess you could say. Um, Needless to say, uh, the United States did draft a lot of young men into the military. Uh, we trained them. Uh, some of our American troops did not arrive in uh, basically Europe until kind of towards the end of 1917, if not the beginning of 1918. And so the U.S. involvement in a physical sense uh, was relatively short compared to maybe the Second World War, where we were involved in it for um, a number of years. So number three, some of the events that led to the end of the fighting of World War I were the tragic German advance towards Paris. Uh, the Germans wanted to, to kind of like do one last uh, ditch effort to, um, to attack 
the Western Front. Got to remember by 1917, 1918, the Russians are out of the war and that frees the Germans up. They don't have to fight a two front battle. Uh, so they are going to move all their men and supplies to the Western Front to attack France. And Paris was kind of the big prize. The problem was the Germans lost just shy of a million troops, so 900,000. Uh, the arrival of U.S. troops also gave the Allies a little boost and the combined use of tanks and aircraft uh, during uh, the siege on the, the Western Front certainly helped the Allies kind of get the upper hand. Number four, the collapse of Russia allowed the Germans to transfer troops uh, from the Eastern Front to France. Uh, the Germans were unprepared for the Allies' use of tanks and aircraft during the Second Battle of the Marne. Uh, as a result, Germans lost, uh, had suffered heavy losses. Uh, they recruited very young soldiers and in some cases very old soldiers uh, to fight uh, kind of in the final few months of the war. Some of these soldiers were basically grade school age. We're talking about soldiers who were probably under the age of 13. Uh, the Germans were lacking food. Uh, there was uh, food riots that were happening in, in parts of uh, that nation. And as a result on the front line, some of our soldiers were, were starving. Uh, there is talk that at times that the German government mixed uh, basically sawdust into some of the, the rations for flour and, and things like that. So uh, certainly it was pretty bleak if you were a soldier in the German army in, in 1917, 1918. After the war, the peace process was difficult uh, because each of the four allies had different uh, goals, which made it difficult to come to some kind of agreement. Uh, world War I actually ends uh, on a particular date. Uh, it actually ends on November uh, 11th, 1918. And it ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Uh, that's kind of what's unique about that. And today, that is also the date that we use to celebrate Veterans Day. Uh, so there, there is some kind of um, you know, relevance to that date in American history. But needless to say, the war itself ended with what we call an armistice, which was an agreement for both sides to stop fighting and that Germany would take uh, basically responsibility for uh, starting the war and propagating it. So this would mean that the Allies obviously would be the winners. Uh, France, as a result of the end of the war, they wanted to severely punish Germany and have them pay for the cost of the war uh, because France had was severely damaged. You got to understand, France was basically uh, kind of the battlefield, not only France, but Belgium and, and some of those regions. Uh, and what ends up happening is the Allies basically forced Germany to pay what is called a reparation. It's basically a payment for war damages. And it was a blistering number. If you take a look here, it's over $55 billion. Um, in today's term, that would be multiple trillions of dollars uh, in damages. Germany at this point in time really couldn't afford to do that. And what ends up happening is Germany slips into basically an economic depression as a result of this. The goal of Italy's leader was different from those of the other negotiators because it wanted to gain territory. Um, you got to remember, Italy was not necessarily a great colonial nation in the sense of, of building colonies around the, the world. And with Germany losing the war, one of the things that they were going to have to give up was some of their territorial claims. And Italy wanted to take advantage of that. World War I also proved costly because nearly 9 million soldiers died and millions more were wounded or taken prisoner. Many national economies were destroyed. Uh, some of the nations and English colonies experienced political unrest. Uh, even though the British and technically the French were the victors in this, uh, they had a lot of support during the war from their colonial uh, territories. Uh, when we talk about the British, you know, India and South Africa had sent troops to go help uh, the British fight this war. And what they were hoping is that they would get 
uh, maybe something in return, like their independence. And when they didn't get that, then they basically rose up and started revolting uh, after the war. The spread of influenza was also a big problem uh, that a lot of people don't talk about, but it, it actually was a huge pandemic, if you think about this. Um, sometimes this influenza is known as the Spanish flu here in the United States, and there's a reason for that. If you take a look at this map uh, from 1915, uh, the green nations are the allied nations, the, the yellow are the central powers. Spain here is not colored in, and it's because it was a neutral nation. And there were some people that thought that, you know, they were kind of, you know, not doing their patriotic cause. And hence this uh, pandemic becomes known as the Spanish flu as a way to kind of, you know, kind of take a jab at um, the Spaniards for not participating in this war. But needless to say, there were um, worldwide numerous casualties as a result of this flu. Matter of fact, uh, when the, the pandemic reached the United States in late 1918 into 1919, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people who died as a result of that, even in this part of the country. Uh, if you go to some of our local cemeteries in Platte County, uh, you're going to find um, a lot of people who died in those years. And part of that is because of this epidemic. Anyway, the influenza grew rapidly in crowded military conditions, and a lot of our soldiers carried it home, thus making this a worldwide problem. Uh, when we talk about uh, the end of the war as far as cost and, is, you know, in terms of life and, and money and such, um, in the terms of life, if you can take a look at the, the different uh, statistics here on these bar graphs. Uh, the United States actually lost very few people in this war. You compare that to the Russians and the Germans and the British and the French. This was a really a, a huge issue because there was a generation of young men who died as a result of that. And what's interesting is within the next generation, we're going to have another world war. Um, when we talk about new nations that came to be as a result of World War I, uh, you have Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria-Hungary, which was once one nation, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Syria, Iraq, um, Transjordan, which today would be known as Jordan, and Palestine and Lebanon all came about as a result of this war. The Treaty of Versailles, uh, which was the treaty that officially ended this war, this was um, signed in 1919, about a year after the war ends. Uh, there are some different provisions. I should mention that the United States could never fully ratify this treaty in our U.S. Senate, and so we had to sign a separate agreement. But these are some of the conditions of the treaty. Uh, first, we would have the birth of the League of Nations. This was something that President Woodrow Wilson had really championed. He, he When he went to the the treaty conference. Uh, this was something that he took with him. Uh, he wanted to have a peacekeeping organization, but because of the fact that this might bring the United States into more wars, our U.S. Senate denied this. And so that's probably one of the main reasons why we never signed the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and we never joined the League of Nations. Uh, along with that. Other things, uh, reparations, as we mentioned before, these are the payments. Uh, Germany had roughly anywhere between 33 to $55 billion that they had to pay back. Uh, Germany's empire was destroyed. Uh, so all the colonial claims that Germany had around the world uh, were taken away and they were given to the victors. So the French, the British, the Italians, they, they all got some territory out of this. Uh, when we talk about the actual homeland of Germany, uh, the actual borders of Germany, uh, they lost land. And so Germany became a much smaller nation. And we saw France gaining territory. Uh, Poland was born. It was a brand new nation as a result of this. Um, Belgium gained territory. Denmark gained territory. Uh, and then finally, the massive military or army cuts that were going to happen. Uh, the German army, and, and eventually, just so you know, um, not only... Would the Germans do this? But a lot of other nations purposely downsized their military right after this war. Uh, but the German military had to cut back their men uh, to just around 100,000. 
Uh, their Navy, they could only have six battleships. They could build no brand new aircraft. They could build no tanks. And the U-boats that they had uh, that were really a lethal weapon during this First World War had to be destroyed. Okay, the whole idea was to keep Germany from ever trying to come back and to fight another war. Uh, what's interesting is they're still able to come back and fight another war. So the League of Nations I mentioned before, uh, public opinion of that was not very good. The man that you see kind of in the middle here that looks like he's uh, trying to, you know, kind of survive the whirlpool uh, is actually our president, Woodrow Wilson, at this time. And hence, the League of Nations is something that he's going down with, I guess. Uh, the effects of World War I, uh, tens of millions of people were killed or wounded. Much of Europe was destroyed. There was widespread political unrest and economic problems. And this really stems right after the end of the war. Uh, there was a great fear that communism would spread into places like Germany. As a matter of fact, um, it's probably that issue alone that brings about the rise of National Socialism or the Nazi Party in Germany. Uh, new countries were formed in Europe, and finally the League of Nations was established. Thank you very much.